everyone to another episode of A Breath of Fresh Marketing. I'm your host, Melissa Ciudakis. Today, I'm here with David Cooper. He is the founder and CEO of IP Secure, a digital brand protection company with a mission to protect the integrity of online marketplaces like Amazon. Backed by 20 plus years of experience safeguarding online brands, Dave's vision for IP Secure was to finally close the gap between protecting IP online and driving e-commerce revenue growth. Hey, Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Dave, thanks so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, um, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I am uh, um, someone who's worked in the space for several decades, as you know, and, and um, during the pandemic decided uh, after leading a, a large M&A transaction um, with my employer, who where I'd been for about 18 years, um, I decided to start IP Secure right in the middle of the pandemic, which so that was about March or April of 2020. And uh, it's been going great. We're on a mission to really change the way um, and how people protect their brands and their revenue uh, on platforms like Amazon. Nice. So, so where are you from originally? <clears throat> so originally I'm from New York um, and lived, you know, all over the tri-state area, uh, New York, New Jersey, um, went to college there in, in that part of the country. And um, for the last 12 years or so have been based in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, primarily because of the technology sector and opportunity that, you know, drew me west. But uh, but I'm I'm a New York guy, you know, born and bred. Yes, yes, I'm a New York gal, born and bred. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, how did you first get interested in in this as a career? Well, I actually started my career in financial services, and uh, my first job was on Wall Street, and. W- from there was exposed to really the technology sector and the internet and, and um, the beginning of it anyway. And, and that was in, in the sort of mid to late nineties. And there was a, a point where uh, I had an opportunity to uh, leave financial services and go and work for a, a, a technology company, which was really part of the very early architecture of the internet. It's a company called Network Solutions. They still exist out there, actually, but they're a very different company today than they were. Um, they, they, in essence, were the only provider on the planet that could uh, sell, market, and issue domain names mm-hmm. and, and were awarded that contract through the, the Commerce Department uh, of the U.S. government. And so uh, working at that company... Um, was a really interesting experience for me and and really exposed me to intellectual property, what it meant, the beginning of internet scams as we know it. You know, the very first type of online abuse really was domain name squatting, were, Mm -hmm. you know, third parties that figured out they could go to network solutions with a credit card and register a domain name, you know, that looked an awful lot like waltdisney.com. And, right. and and people would accidentally show up at these websites, you know, through a typo on their keyboard or or, or whatever. So um, we were, and I was exposed to these types of scams very early on. And after leaving Network Solutions, eventually made my way to a, a really small company at the time based in the Bay Area called Mark Monitor. And uh, that was about 2002. We created the first platform that really automated the process for someone to go to eBay in this case um, and detect a counterfeit product or an unauthorized usage of a copyright, like a logo, right? Or a product image and a listing. And eBay had a system where you could manually report that to them. And and we decided it'd be a great idea to work with eBay and figure out how we automate this process and scale it um, and, and introduce it to a lot of the intellectual property attorneys and corporate legal departments that we were already working with. And that was sort of the beginning of the online brand protection space. Fast forward 20 years, we had several different successful liquidity events at Mark Monitor. We grew that company to you know, well over $100 million in, in annual gross revenue. And it was a great, great experience. 
And, and I learned a lot. And when I left, you know, my, my last role, uh, I was determined to really create a business and more importantly, a product that addressed what I felt like were significant shortcomings in, in what I had created and sold, you know, evangelically around the world from Latin America to Europe, to the U S I traveled the globe selling the technology and the processes we had created. Um, and they were fantastic, but, but it's time now t- to evolve to something that is more powerful, more sophisticated, and more importantly, um, isn't just about protecting, you know, most solutions are about just keeping you safe when we find it, we take it out. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. But if you do whack-a-mole at scale, right, it can be effective. Our solution is more about picking the right opportunities to defend your intellectual property and your brand and your sales channel, because you know that in doing so, the byproduct or the result of that action will be you sell more product through authorized channels. And that's a good thing. Uh, That connection doesn't exist uh, as far as I'm aware, beyond IP secures technology. And, and that's really you know, what we're trying to do and, and why we're doing it because of the journey that I've had. Wow, uh, that, that's pretty awesome. And yeah, I, I remember Network Solutions from years ago, and then I think they were bought out by web.com, right? <laughs> Eventually, um, we were actually initially bought by a company called VeriSign. And VeriSign uh, really was the market leader in SSL certificate creation and PKI encryption and and, and a variety of of much heavier security capabilities and technologies. But again, all related to websites and and identification and and, and securing the connection between consumers that we knew wanted to access the internet and website content. Um, and so VeriSign bought us and, and, you know, lots of different stuff happened. There's been a tremendous amount of M&A activity throughout the industry. Wow. <clears throat> so what was it like transitioning to your own company? Um, it's, God, it's, it's a variety of emotions. It is, well, first, I'm very lucky, you know, that um, I was able to, partner with investors and, and have a, you know, supportive family and, and my wife's amazing and, and everybody's been extremely supportive of me doing this. And I think making the transition has been challenging and rewarding at the same time. I, I really feel like there are, um, ways that we can expand the addressable market of people who can protect their assets on platforms like Amazon. And um, through simplification and through really not repeating the same mistakes that a lot of the incumbent vendors and incumbent solutions have made, because we're new, we benefit from hindsight. And so our technology is architected differently, our approach to the market is different, and our value proposition is different. That's extremely exciting for me. Um, I'm very passionate about the space. About the space, uh, on a personal level, it's extremely challenging, as you know, starting your own business um, and the responsibility that comes with uh, with all of that. But um, we take it one day at a time. Here, we keep you know trying to move the ball forward and make good choices and and hire good people. You know, I mean, I think for me, the, the most successful points in my career have been when I was surrounded by people who were really good and passionate and cared about what they did, whether they were working for me on my team or I was reporting to them. When you surround yourself with people who view the world as you do and have an evangelical passion for creating this change in the market, then anything is possible. I had a mentor for years, um, a good friend of mine who I still talk to, was my boss for a long time and a mentor. And he would constantly tell me, Dave, the product is almost irrelevant. He believed that strongly in the power of the team and the message and tenacity and hard work that you could have any product and, and, and in his view, be successful if you have those other elements. So I want to do uh, obviously both, have a, a world-class innovative product that creates unique value for users and surround myself with really good, smart, intelligent people. And I think if we do that, we'll make some mistakes, but we'll, we'll get where we want to go. Okay. That's great. 
So tell me about your CTO and co-founder, Chris Anderson. Sure. Um, so I'm not an engineer. I'm a sales and marketing guy my, my entire career. Um, I think I have a passion for the strategy and, and, and for the product, and I'm technical. But you know, shortly after starting the business, it was apparent to me that I, I needed a partner who cared as much as I did and, and frankly had the, the skills and the capability. Chris and I met through a mutual friend, a former coworker that I worked with several years back. And I got lucky because Chris is a serial entrepreneur and he's had varying, you know, he's had big success in his career. Um, but when you go and you really try to do the startup thing and that's your focus and your passion, uh, every once in a while you have one that doesn't work out. And, and, and I was lucky to catch Chris in between opportunities and grab him off the market before he found the next really exciting thing. And he's been fantastic. He's been wonderful. Um, he, he is an expert in technologies like machine learning and more sophisticated technologies that I think are really important. But the, the best thing that you know a startup company can have, I think, is someone with um, the ability to see both the big picture, but also dig deep into the detail and understand the full stack of technology and you know, part of our mission or, or part of our, uh, excuse me, our values here at IP Secure is, you know, everyone sweeps the floor. And, and that means, you know, there are no egos and titles are pretty irrelevant. And Chris is the kind of guy that's more than willing to jump into the weeds with me and roll up his sleeves, but, but also highly capable at, at, you know, thinking big picture, making choices today that enable us to, and, you know, um, institute our, our, strategy later. And so that's that's unique. Chris has a great ability, I think, to um, interact with the business side um, and do it in a way that we understand. Uh, it, you know, as any sales and marketing guy, I'll tell you, when you're interacting with engineers and the technical side of your business, we're not always speaking the same language. And uh, Chris, you know, speaks multiple languages, thank God. So uh, we're, we're lucky to have him. He's a, he's a great asset for us. That's awesome. So one of IP secure selling points is that you help protect brands from unauthorized sellers. Can yeah. you give me a brief overview of, of what that means? Sure. So uh, if you think about Amazon, um, it, it is this you know massive ecosystem with you know millions and millions of products right for sale 24 hours a day. There are anywhere from a couple thousand to 4,000 new merchants daily that are added to this platform on a global basis. So this is a massive ecosystem. It's also the most important platform for e-commerce professionals in the United States. Now, I realize depending on your business model, what you sell, you know, maybe there are other platforms that are as important to you, but those are fringe cases. The, the overwhelming majority of brands and, and companies that take advantage of e-commerce, uh, uh, care about Amazon. It's 50 cents of every dollar, almost 50 cents of every dollar spent on e-commerce in, in the United States is spent on, on amazon.com. So what we do is um, our technology is designed to identify all the sellers of a particular product and then score those sellers and weight them based on the criteria of the user. So the user inputs their own perspective of what a bad seller or an unauthorized seller looks like or a counterfeit seller, right? And um, that input then is driven into a scoring model, which enables the user to instantly identify the sellers that are outside the norm, okay? This is our algorithm within the application working in real time, taking the user's roles, applying those across millions and millions of sellers, and then boiling up for you the ones that are outside of the normal use cases. Those are the sellers that you focus on to validate you know, what they're selling is authentic, or are they a licensee, are they not? It all depends on the model right, in the company. And then we give the users ability to see a variety of data and analytics about those sellers, and then eventually potentially take actions to, to remove those sellers and remove the unauthorized offer from Amazon. So when a consumer types in that brand and visits that product listing, the merchant's not there. 
that opportunity, right, to sell that unauthorized product no longer exists. The big difference with IP Secure is the sellers that we tell you to focus on are the ones that are also selling products right alongside the good guys. Mm. And so as you remove the bad guys, the good guys sell more. The good guys sell more. So think about every listing on Amazon, not as a, a static product listing, but think of it almost like a virtual flea market. And the listing exists in the center. And it doesn't change that much, right? And you've got anywhere from a couple to hundreds of sellers coming and going, setting up shop right next to that listing and saying, I sell it too. I sell it too. Well, some of them sell it at different price points, different shipping times, mm -hmm. different consumer experiences. Right. What we do is we sit inside that virtual flea market 24 hours a day, right? Analyze everybody coming and going. And then the user now knows which sellers to pursue to have that result of increased good sales, which is really what we're going for. Now, at the end of the day, the number one mandate for an intellectual property enforcement manager or brand protection person is to stop counterfeit sales, protect the consumer, protect the integrity of the brand. Mm -hmm. We're doing that. But we're not only doing all of that, we're also making sure you sell more products and enabling you to track that. That is a, a key significant difference in the approach that IP Secure takes versus the sort of indiscriminate approach that most solutions uh, you know, are employing today. Yeah. I hope that helps you understand what we do on Amazon. Yes, yes, it does. Very clear. Thank you. Sure. So who would you say your ideal client is? <clears throat> well, you, you know, I, I think um, that's an interesting question because we, we've we intentionally built our product and our approach to expand the addressable market. You know, the, the majority of, again, the incumbents and the companies that are doing brand protection today are very focused on what they call the corporate intellectual property space. And even when they say that, what they mean are, are big brands, brands you've heard of, right? The Nikes of the world. Mm -hmm. Um and, and that's an, a, an extremely important space and, and one we believe we can absolutely focus on. Uh, and, and we talk to many of those companies, they see real value in our products. However, the, the area that I think is the most in need and, and more importantly, much larger um, from uh, about, you know, an opportunity standpoint really is the, the small and medium size portion of the economy where you've got millions and millions of small businesses that sell physical products or are distributors for larger brands, mm -hmm. um, their livelihood depends on success on a platform like Amazon. And you, you know, you hear story after story of you know these great products that come out, they go viral, they're on Amazon for two weeks, and there are you know foreign counterfeiters that move in create almost exactly the same product, you know, slightly different name perhaps, and, and are, are listing those right alongside, you, you know, the, the individual who started it all. And, and it crushes their business, destroys their business. Mm -hmm. So I want to provide that small business with the same caliber ammunition as Nike. And the way we do that is by building a system that is really simple yet powerful uh, and effective. And, and, and if we do it right, um, we can sell it extremely cost effectively to that small business. Um, and it doesn't have to cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to do it because we're using extremely modern technology. And more importantly, IP Secure is a pure SaaS company, which means we're in the business of building a SaaS system and then licensing its usage, right, to users, customers, people who want to use it. I'm not in the business of building, you know, a massive services organization full of junior analysts. And when you use a lot of the incumbent solutions today, you're not really paying for technology. You're paying for people to literally sit there to do searches on Amazon or Google, look at content, make a decision, send a letter manually. That's not a technology solution. Now, maybe it's appropriate for a lot of people to have a services approach to this problem. I, I'm not against services businesses, but 
but don't call it SaaS because it isn't. It's a services business. So IP Secure is creating a business that is going to be able to innovate much faster because we're not going to be crushed under the weight of our own, you know, massive services, complex services component. Mm-hmm. And we're agnostic. Anyone can use our product. Law firms, brands, e-commerce managers, other vendors, you know, we don't, we are sort of the slack of brand protection. And, and therefore, there aren't uh, really limits to who we think can benefit from the product. We also are really focused a lot on, on you know, allowing third parties to take our solution mm-hmm. and white label it. There is strong demand. Why should I spend a lot of money for a services solution, you know, outside of my organization that I have to manage and control? Can I just get the tools and resources I need internally, use my own people, and now I have my own solution? Right. Um, to me, this, you know, this trend of do it for me is is going to come to a close, especially as if the economy goes through significant peaks and valleys. How many companies are going to continue to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on external analysts when they can bring that process in-house for a fraction of the cost, higher quality, uh, and really get their arms around it? So yeah. I, I think it's not only the tech, it's, it's sort of the business models, too, that I think give us an advantage. Nice. Yeah, that, that all makes sense. <clears throat> so what would be one of the worst case scenarios if you didn't have good IP protection? Oh boy, uh, you could go out of business. I'll, I'll I'll tell a story really quickly if that's okay. I mean, this sure. is many years ago, but um, I got a call from uh, an individual in New York City who, and I was in San Francisco at the time, and they were the owner of a company that created cell phone cases, and they had a patent, a small business, five people, you know, minimal sales but growing. Um, well, someone on a, a reality TV show, which I won't name. Um, decided that they were going to use the cell phone case and talk about it on their TV show. Mm. And they went from a $5 million a year company to a $25 million a year company in about 60 days. Um, And called me up and said, you know, the minute this happened, great success. We're really excited. There are hundreds of, of confusingly similar, practically identical cell phone cases now on Amazon that because bad guys are smarter than us, believe it or not, and they're more nimble. And all they have to do is react to the market and take advantage and see this opportunity. And they have manufacturing capability already or the capability to acquire product quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, Producing counterfeits is inexpensive, especially if it's a fairly simplistic product like a cell phone case, um, and flood the market, take advantage right, uh, of this fantastic event that happened for this company. Mm-hmm. And it was devastating for them. Um, and I think, you know, this, this, this sort of thing will continue to kind of happen. And, and I think small businesses are going to keep finding that the bad guys are really smart and fast and capable. Uh, Amazon is fantastic company spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year Mm -hmm. to stop unauthorized distribution. You know, say what you want. No other platform in the world is spending as much to stop the issue. Now they're one of the biggest, so it's relative, but you know, it's unbelievable, right? Um, th- the size and scope of the uh, the demand for unauthorized product is because it's profitable and it's easy um, to do. So, um, you know, I think a- a- as a business, you've got to pay attention to this. Don't ever think you're too small to become a victim of this. They love the small guys. They know you don't have the defenses. They know you might be late to react to it. So they're actually much more interested in targeting you than they are a big brand, you know, that has technology and has a team. So don't wait until it happens, assume it already is and go looking for it. And and if you get a tool like IP secures and your focus is not only the protection side of the problem, 
but how you can choose the right protection to facilitate growth. Um, I think starting with that approach from day one means you're not only have your legal IP hat on, but you have your e-commerce hat on. Um, we're finding a lot of success with companies that are in multiple models, meaning um, companies that are third-party sellers on Amazon. So they sell other people's products on Amazon with a license, of course. Mm -hmm. Perhaps also own their own brands, have some brands they own in-house. So now they're selling direct to consumer on Amazon. Um, they have a variety of those models occurring. Our product is extremely attractive to them because it enables them to defend their IP rights, right? When it's their product that's being infringed, mm -hmm. it enables them to enforce licensing contracts when it's their channel that they're mm -hmm. selling through on Amazon. It gives them a lot of broad capabilities. Um, and, and again, I think that makes companies like that, very interesting for IP secure. Um, you know, some brands, you sit with them and you say, well, are you worried about, you know, what's happening on Amazon? And they might say something like, uh, well, we don't sell on Amazon, um, which isn't true. Um, they may not sell direct to consumer on Amazon, right? As a conscious choice, a business model they don't want to be involved in, but their products are all over the platform. Somebody's selling your product on Amazon. It's just not you. So, <laughs> right. you know, the days of saying, you know, I, I don't have to deal with it or it doesn't impact me the way you think it does, Dave, because we don't sell on Amazon. That's not reality. Your products are there. Your intellectual property is there. You know, if I buy a product on Amazon and it hurts me or it's not legitimate or even if it is legitimate, but my buying experience is terrible shows up two weeks late, the box is ripped open, products all dirty. You think I'm going to buy that brand again? Of course not. At least not right away. Right. So everyone has a vested interest in protecting themselves on Amazon because it is the world's largest marketplace, the most important marketplace, and you ignore it at your own peril, whether you sell there consciously or not. Right. Well, so what are some of the common misunderstandings about security that brand owners have when starting out? I mean, do some of them not know that they're vulnerable? Um, I think they feel like it, you know, it's a problem. Well, I think there's a couple of dynamics going on. I think if you work at a, at a large, successful company, uh, a multinational company, a Fortune 500 company, um, it almost becomes the cost of doing business to some degree, right? Um, because it, it feels like it, there's no end to it. feels like playing whack-a-mole, right? Uh, and most companies, even big companies that I've worked with the largest on the planet, um, will have a legal department and various disciplines represented there. But it's not like they have you know, hundreds of IP attorneys, right, who can deal with all of the problems and infringement that's occurring on the internet. It's, it's simply sort of not possible. And then I think, so there's this element of, Let's do as much as reasonable, right? So that we can demonstrate externally we are doing as much as reasonable, um, but not having to break the bank or ask for more budget or do something unnatural. And the reason that dynamic exists with big companies is because there's no return on investment. You know, protecting your customers is paramount because for all sorts of reasons, not only brand integrity, but, but consumer safety. My God, if someone gets hurt, that's liability. Right. And, and those are foregone conclusions that are already factored in. Mm -hmm. but, but when you go to a C-level meeting and explain to people what you're spending on online brand protection, um, th their ability to connect that to an economic return or a revenue-based return for the, for the company doesn't exist. And so there's a fear, right, to go all in. With small companies... Uh, I think it's fear of cost, you know, and complexity. And, and we're helping solve that by creating simplified technology and making it highly cost effective. So even someone with little to no experience in doing this sort of brand protection activity could hop on and within minutes be doing it. So we're going to change the perspective of the large brands by showing them that this is not just a legal problem. This is a business problem. And the result of, of sort of, intelligent um, mitigation to this business problem 
is more sales. Mm -hmm. And if when we draw that correlation in concrete, you know what happens? Budgets get bigger. People mm -hmm. go all in on brand protection. All of a sudden, brand protection is what everyone wants to do. So that's how we're going to change that dynamic. We're going to help the other side, um, the smaller side, uh, the long tail, if you will, of the market through the simplification and the cost-effective approach. So I think there are different issues at play, depending on who you talk to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> so as quoted on your website, your inspiration behind IP Secure was to, quote, finally bridge the gap between protecting IP online and driving e-commerce revenue through growth, end quote. What was the relationship between IP protection and e-commerce revenue growth before starting IP Secure? Theoretical, right? It's it, it's sort of like, you know, for 20 years, we sold brand protection solutions in the space. And it was the, the thing that we always would talk about with a customer. And, you know, customers want that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think a big part of that is because the industry was born out of the legal side of, of most organizations and out of really the legal industry, which makes sense, right? Because we're enforcing intellectual property rights, which are trademarks, copyrights, patents. Um, and so, so that makes total sense. But it's time to evolve now. You know, it's time to become something larger than just a legal tool to, to protect us most of the time, maybe. Right. It, it's now going to become an indispensable part of a business strategy to succeed on the Internet. Um, that's the difference. I've been to I've probably worked with 5000 brands. I, I don't know, thousands over my career. And the one consistent has always been you walk in, you sit down with their legal team and they tell you we've got a counterfeit problem online. You explain what you do. They go, it's great. And then you ask them. Um, or you realize that down the hall, they have an e-commerce team. Well, that e-commerce team is focused on the same platforms the legal team is. They're not looking for infringement because that's not their job. What they're looking to do is sell more stuff on those platforms. These teams need to work together, right? They need to sit together and use the same solution. And as the brand protection enforcement side, uh, whether that's legal or otherwise, you know, it's like a balloon. You push down on one side of the balloon, which is really the abuse and the infringement. The other side of the balloon rises up. Right. Those are your sales. That's your e-commerce activity. That's your buy box win rates. So if they coordinate, it's great. That's like step one. Get them in the same room, talking the same language. Um, and we would do that when we could. Um, the difference now is our, our technology is designed to do that. Uh, and, and that's a huge leap forward than talking about things in a theoretical way. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. So what does IP Secure offer that sets you apart from other brand protection providers? <laughs> I, again, I mean, I don't even really put us in the same category because we're not a managed service, right? As I mentioned, all of the incumbent providers um, that are focused on that corporate IP space, um, to, to a big extent, almost all of them market and sell a system, a proprietary platform. But really, when you buy that, you know, two thirds or 75% of the cost is a person who actually logs in and uses it for you, which is, if you think about it, kind of bizarre. Um, it, it's the only SaaS platform that nobody uses. Uh, now, now, I think um, there's different reasons for that. And, and, and a, a big part of it is because, in, you know, Brand protection is a fairly subjective thing. And, you know, one user might be, you know, one user's approach, right, to a counterfeit seller online may not be the same as another user's approach to dealing with that. So I, I get that. But one of the biggest differences here is um, we believe that that model is highly inefficient. And, and so we're eliminating managed services. Um, so people license our technology. They can decide to use it themselves or they can designate any, anyone they want. I'm simply not going to sell them, right, uh, uh, an analyst and, and bill them by the hour because that's not the business IP Secure is in. Uh, we are a pure SaaS company uh, and, and we'll generate success by licensing our technology and, and, and having users use it. Um, I also think the reason for the services component 
is most technology, for the exception of ours, um, uses or relies almost exclusively on keywords to harvest content. So, um, you know, using a system that would go out to a platform like Amazon and, you know, plug in keywords, and then you get a whole lot of information. If you plug in Lululemon into Amazon, you're going to get, you know, 10,000 listings, right? Mm -hmm. Well, most systems then suck all those listings into their system. And a person looks at all of them, right? To determine, is this legit? Is this not legit? Does this look off? Is this maybe a counterfeit? What's going on here? Right. That model doesn't work at all on Amazon, first of all, because sellers don't, ha don't create new listings. They get attached, right, to ASINs, to listings that are already there. That's the first problem with that model on Amazon. Um, the, the second problem is it generates enormous amounts of, of irrelevant data. Someone has to weed through that. IP Secure's product does not harvest data by keyword. We are focused on those ASIN numbers that I spoke about earlier. And so if I care about a certain type of product, um, let's say I care about Claritin, 24-hour tablets, you know, XYZ SKU number, um, well, only one of those should exist on Amazon. Right. And by monitoring it 24 hours a day, I see all the sellers coming and going and attaching and reattaching and detaching from that listing. Mm -hmm. So instead of, it's the difference between jumping in the ocean and swimming around indiscriminately, right? To look for whatever it is, the, the type of shell you're looking for. We don't do that. Instead, we jump in the ocean, we sink to the bottom and we wait. And when the, you know, when that shell floats by, we grab it. Um, it's a, it's a very different way. And it means that we don't have false positives. It doesn't take hours to search our system to find people that are selling your product in bad ways. That data, that's all there is in our system. The whole concept of sort of non-relevant data has been eliminated from our product. And that's a huge win and a huge win for efficiency and for cost. It means I can charge less to use the system. It means you find what you need in minutes, not hours. Um, it, it's a significant leap forward as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> so uh, what are your company values? Oh God, I mean, I think our, our having worked at a small company when I joined you know, the firm I was with, we were very small and then we eventually became part of a $12 billion conglomerate and, you know, having worked in really small companies and then growing right to a hundred million plus, and then being bought by this billion dollar behemoth. Um, I, I have a lot of passionate feelings about transparency. Um, so, so the very first thing that matters to us as a business is to be transparent with each other, with our customers, with our investors, with everyone who matters. Um, I, I believe strongly in that. I think a lack of transparency creates mistrust amongst the people you care about, all the ones I mentioned, employees, customers, investors. And so the smartest thing we can do in almost any situation, whether that's with a customer, anything, uh, be transparent. So, so that's a big part of it. Uh, I mentioned uh, sweep the floor. Um, and the elimination of egos to the extent that you can accomplish that it, it is significant and has a really big impact on the business. Um, my CTO and I are oftentimes working 11, 12 o'clock at night, you, you know, right alongside our most junior engineers um, and, and vice versa. So there's an element of winning and getting where we need to be at all costs. Um, the last thing that I feel really strongly about, and this is probably because I'm a sales and sort of business development guy at heart, um, is, is, you know, put customers first mm -hmm. in, in every decision you make. If, if, if you think about that decision through the lens of how does this benefit my customer, um, you won't always make the right choice, but you will more times than not. And, uh, I, I believe really strongly in that and, and, a lot of times businesses make choices because they believe it's going to help them in one way or another. And that may not be in, in, the, in their own customer's best interest. Um, and I, I, so I believe strongly in that, you know, and, and I think that all plays into the brand loyalty that you want to create with your customers and your employees and your vendors. If they believe and they know that you care about them 
and you put them first, um, they're going to give you that same, you know, that same treatment in return. Um, and, and to me, that's vital for the long-term success, you know, of the business, especially when people can renew contracts with us or not renew and, and employees can come and go at will. It, it's all we have. It's all we've got. Yeah, absolutely. How has IP security changed with the rise of big brand marketplaces such as Amazon? You know, it's made it a lot more difficult, obviously. You know, I, I think the internet in general has, but the explosion of e-commerce means um, a variety of things. First, there was sort of the advent of, of platforms that sold products. Then there were platforms that had third-party sellers selling products. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting. I saw this. I don't remember how I saw it. Maybe it was on LinkedIn, but... Um, uh, Barron's, you know, the weekly ma- uh, weekly newspaper that comes out wrote out this piece on Jeff Bezos in the late nineties about how his business model was insane. You know, that, you know, really what it was about was retailers creating their own e-commerce platforms, right? Like you going to Macy's.com because Macy's wants to sell direct to you. It's like that's the future. And this guy, Jeff Bezos came out, he said, no, 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 no. The future is the virtual flea market where you could buy from hundreds of different people, right? And, and you know, so he's, Amazon has changed the entire e-commerce world um, and sort of turned it on its head and made it, made a complex problem, which was really about finding all those direct-to-consumer platforms um, exponentially more difficult. And, um, and then, and on top of that, you know, the Amazon copycat effect where you've got, um, Alibaba in China and Taobao, and you've got, you know, Walmart now, right. Which is arguably probably the second most important platform or soon to be, uh, in the United States. So there's not just one Amazon now there's hundreds of them. Right. I think the guiding principle for me is, and, and this is part of the changes in the market, you know, in, in the beginning in brand protection, people wanted solutions that did everything, mm-hmm. you know, and it was all about how many platforms you covered. Well, I cover all 500 platforms. Um, and, and to a large degree, there's still validity in that today. However, I think what's really more important to a strategic C-level executive is talk to me about the platforms where I have significant economic interest, like Amazon, like Walmart, places where we want to sell and we would set up shop, right? Um, how many brands do you know that are setting up shop on these obscure international platforms that are riddled with counterfeits. It's, it's just not a big focus, right, for them in terms of their core business, their core e-commerce strategy. So my, my suggestion for people is focus on the platforms that you are going to invest in for the success of your business. Um, and if you stick to that rule of thumb, you're going to find most of what matters. You, you know, you're going you're gonna to tackle the problems that really uh, increase and and make your bottom line more healthy. Um, you may sacrifice not finding some counterfeits, you, you know, in some faraway country somewhere on a platform nobody visits. I get that, mm-hmm. um, but when you've mastered the core competency of the platforms that matter, you can expand your program, right, and start going out to other platforms. So. Um, that would be my suggestion it would be, um, start small and, and get a good process down. Right. And, and, you know, if Amazon is 50% of your sales, mm-hmm. it should be at least 50% of your focus from your a brand protection perspective, if not a hundred percent, right. If, if, that, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. So how do you hope to see IP secure grow in the next five to 10 years? What, what's the plan? Um, you know, I think the plan is to um, continue to invest in our product. You, you know, we have uh, invested millions of dollars already. We'll invest millions more. And I think it's all, to me, it's all about the product. And if, if our product solves real problems for real people um, and it's simplified in a way that it expands the audience, then we'll have all sorts of people doing brand protection who weren't doing it before, doing it more cost effectively. And you know what else will happen? Amazon wins because we're helping them clean up the platform and doing it in a highly cost effective way. Right. So Amazon wins, customers win, 
you know, there's less uh, less risk that they're going to click buy mm-hmm. and get it from a third party seller. They shouldn't. Um, and so, so my vision is, you know, we're scaling the business. We're growing, hopefully, significantly at that point, um, and and we're growing adoption and expanding the market. And I think if we do that successfully, we're going to have a great future. Um, and we'll think about other platforms and we'll think about other places to go. But we're going to stay true to that strategy of focus on, you know, where our customers are generating revenue for themselves, right? That's where we want to be an indispensable partner. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that sounds great. So to those in our audience who might be interested in this kind of work, what sort of people would you say are best suited for this particular field? Oh God. I mean, I think it's one of those things that, um, I do believe anyone can do it. And, and, you know, there are even universities now that are building a lot of curriculum around brand protection and intellectual property enforcement techniques, especially as it relates to the internet. So I do believe like anyone can participate in this industry. I love it because if you, I perform better when I am passionate about what I'm doing and when you're, you know, removing harmful products from the internet, when you're helping automotive companies, you know, deal with counterfeit brake pads, when you're, um, when you're able to market and sell a product like ours and also benefit from the altruistic goals, right. That our users have, that's pretty special, you know, that's pretty special. Um, counterfeiting is a problem that is not just on its surface about the loss of revenue to a brand. It fuels human trafficking. It's involved in, in drugs, terrorism, you you know, a lot of organized crime elements, both here and internationally have discovered that, you know, trafficking and counterfeit, uh, high-end luxury products is a lot less risky and easier than trafficking and heroin. So, um, we are having an impact and, and, and I love that about the business. And so I think whether you're someone just starting out in college, you don't know what you want to do, or you're maybe someone who's worked in the legal field, um, or the sales and marketing field. Uh, if you're looking for something that you could like really get behind and really care about, um, and, and make a difference, you know, it's brand protection. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. So who would you say are your biggest supporters? Uh, by far my wife and daughter <laughs> for putting up with me. Um, my wife is an amazing partner and the love of my life and has support. I mean, you know, when you leave your job in the middle of, you know, a once in a hundred year pandemic and you tell your wife, I'm going to think I'm going to leave. And uh, yeah, I'm going to leave. I'm going to, you know, have no paycheck for 18 months and, uh, you know, see how it works out. Um, that takes a lot of faith a lot of support, a lot of love, and she's been wonderful. So, so it's definitely my family, first and foremost. Um, our employees are amazing, and our investors are incredible. You know, I think I'm very lucky that I found a group of investors, and, and I'll name, you know, their Manhattan Venture Partners uh, is who we work with in New York City. Jared Carmel is the founder and partner there, and Bill Barco, um, and, uh, and, and the, the rest of the team. The guys are amazing. And, you know, they believed in my vision and they were willing to come on board and take a significant risk based on, you know, the market, the experience I have, the potential for what we're doing. And they see the potential to disrupt this industry. I'm not creating a brand new product that's never sort of accomplished what people wanted to accomplish before. That's not what we're doing. We're taking a fairly mature space. And we're making it a lot better. And that's a different value proposition, right? Than a lot of startups are are selling. And and they believed in it. And I'm uh, forever grateful and and I love working with them. So uh, our employee, my family, our employees, our investors, and then of course our customers, our beta users. Um, You know, brands have been amazing. And, and I won't share any games with you, but but they are Fortune 500 brands that people are well aware of and, 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 and household names. 
And I'm confident that they're going to help us for, continue to refine the product and get it, you know, where we want it to be. That's awesome. Very cool. So if anyone would like to learn more about IP Secure, where should they go? Uh, IPSecure.com is uh, our website. You could go there. You could reach out to us. Um, you can email me at Dave at IPSecure.com anytime. I'm constantly accessible. And, uh, you know, anything we can do to help, whether it's just information, whether it's pointing you in the right direction, you have a problem on Amazon, or if you'd like to actually, you know, use the product and, and see if it can um, create real value for you, uh, you know, we're a resource for here to help. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining on the show today. It's been a pleasure having you and I wish you the best. It's a really cool business model that you have. And uh, right. so it's, uh, it's very different from from the uh, companies that are out there today. So I think what you're doing is really great. So I'm excited to see more. Cool. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. And thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of A Breath of Fresh Marketing. Be well.